to run this campaign so you can see what kind of senator I will be. A senator who will tell you what he thinks and believes in a new politics, a new agenda, and a fundamentally new approach to solving our problems. I've called this new philosophy big citizenship. It's in that spirit that I'm here today to talk to you about what we should do in Afghanistan. It should concern all of us enough to stop at this critical moment to re-examine our mission, why we're there, and how we achieve our national interests. If I were your senator today, this is the speech I would give on the Senate floor. Because the decisions we make about Afghanistan will affect every aspect of our future. We went to Afghanistan to destroy Al-Qaeda and the terrorists who attacked our homeland. 9-11. It was the right war at the right time, and our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines did a remarkable job. As of a year ago, the director of the CIA reported we had effectively removed the last remnants of Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan. He highlighted the need to pursue them in other countries, especially Pakistan. But over time, our commitment had changed, and our brave sons and daughters who took their lives on the line to defend our freedom against the terrorists, were asked to fight a new war, a much harder and longer war, against, not against Al-Qaeda, but against the Taliban and other Afghan insurgents. We've lost our way, strayed from our mission, and now we are asking our troops to build a nation in a place that is laden with corruption and has never had a strong central government. This isn't in our interest as a nation, and it isn't fair to our troops. And as we have lost our way in Afghanistan, I know people are hurting here at home. You've lost your jobs, your homes, your savings. Too many are searching the internet, walking the neighborhoods, and scanning newspapers for work. If you're a student, you're wondering if there will be a job from, for you after you graduate. If you're a small business owner, you're struggling to stay in business with health care costs rising at more than 30% a year. <coughs> if you're a military family, you are wondering how many tours your loved ones will have to endure, whether you will be called up, whether your son or daughter, wife or husband, mom or dad, will come home safely. And for years, we've been losing our way of family members overseas in protract protracted wars in which often the rationale for goals and objectives and the costs have not been clearly explained to the American people or the citizens of Massachusetts. And so today I want to talk to you about how we lost our way in Afghanistan, about the tremendous cost of this war, why we need a new approach to pursue our national interests, and my 10-point plan for how to do that. Here are my overall recommendations. We need to return to our original mission, destroy Al-Qaeda, and ensure that Afghanistan does not become a haven for terrorists. To pursue that mission, we do not need more troops in Afghanistan, and over time we should draw down our forces and bring them home. We need to set a timetable whereby we transition counterinsurgency operations from American and international forces to the Afghan government. We need to focus on Pakistan, where Al-Qaeda is, and because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. General McChrystal has developed a plan to fight a counterinsurgency campaign. But President Obama needs to decide whether a counterinsurgency campaign is truly in our national interests. <coughs> Pulling back from Afghanistan militarily is not about reducing pressure on Al-Qaeda, but actually freeing up resources to press the fight harder. This is not about fighting the terrorists less. It's about fighting them smarter, pressing them harder, and seeking them out where they have fled around the globe. We must defeat the terrorists. I don't believe we can best do that by putting so many resources into rebuilding one single country halfway around the globe. Of course, it's up to the president to determine the strategy in Afghanistan and the region. But the Senate, as designed in our Constitution, has a unique role to play in shaping U.S. foreign policy. And I believe that you, as citizens, should know how your potential next senator thinks about America's role in the world. Now, we all know the administration is deeply involved in reviewing policy, strategy, and troop levels for Afghanistan. 
And I appreciate the president is taking his time to decide what will likely be the most momentous decision <coughs> of his presidency. Over the past several weeks, I have consulted with a number of leading experts in developing my own thinking as to what our policy in Afghanistan should be. I am a student of history. As Rob said, I have traveled to more than 30 countries. I've met with government, business, and civil society leaders, leaders who are making a difference on the ground, from India to Africa, Europe to the Middle East, Russia, China, and more. The challenges of this century are fundamentally different from those of the last, because we are living in an era of problems without borders, and their consequences and their solutions belong to everyone on Earth. Global ch climate change is tied to economic growth, is tied to clean energy, is tied to security, is tied back to climate change. We can't solve these tangled global challenges by going it alone, nor by military means alone. This web of challenges requires new thinking and a new approach. As Lincoln said in another time of great crisis, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Now, what President Obama has accomplished in just 10 months is simply extraordinary. Before he took office, our nation's accumulated errors in the Middle East, our misguided strategy of preemptive warfare, and our arrogant insistence on going it alone had left America's reputation in tatters. Barack Obama has largely restored America's moral footing. He has reminded the world what this country stands for at its best and why our political ideals endure. At the same time, I take inspiration from Senator Kennedy's conviction and courage on matters of foreign policy. He said repeatedly his vote against the Iraq war was his proudest. Not because he didn't want to defend our country, he did. He just didn't believe the hype about the connection between 9-11 and Iraq, and he was right. Senator Kennedy also understood the connection between misguided wars at home and the devastating impact, misguided wars abroad, and the devastating impact at home. The crushing price of trillion dollar wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have driven up the national deficit and debt. The wars also played a major role in pushing up the price of oil from $27 a barrel in 2003 to over $115 a barrel in 2008, which led to skyrocketing gas prices, weakened our economy, and contributed to last year's economic meltdown. The last time we borrowed from abroad to fund a war, it was the American Revolution. And now we're paying interest to the Chinese <coughs> so we can send soldiers and Marines we cannot spare on the wrong mission. Just as troubling, we're ignoring the true costs we will incur, incur long-term costs that will bleed our economy dry over decades. And most importantly, there is no issue more domestic than the suffering of our service members and the ones they love. Sisters and brothers, uncles and aunts, friends and fellow citizens have come home from this war, often after multiple deployments, gravely injured to a country unprepared to give them the care and support they deserve and need. You have the right to know what the true cost of this war will be in both American lives and national treasure. You have the right to know what the goals are, what our strategy is to achieve them, and how long it will realistically take. And we have learned ultimately, if we cannot convince you, the citizens, to support our involvement in foreign conflicts, it is not sustainable and it will not succeed. So what are those costs? 